All right, so we shall begin on chapter three now. Okay, chapter three, we're going to talk about the concepts of uh, concepts and responsibilities of home ownership. Okay, so our objectives for this chapter is we want to identify the various types of housing choices that are available to home buyers. And we also want to discuss the primary considerations for determining the housing affordability. We'll further explain the tax benefits of home ownership, distinguish the various types of homeowners in regards to insurance policies, and relate them to property damage claims. And lastly, we will describe in regard to describe the requirement for and the coverage that's going to be provided by a flood insurance policy. Okay. Now, you will need to know this, not only just in your daily life, but you will actually need to know this when you're practicing, okay? Because if you don't know this, I promise you, I promise you, it will throw you for a loop when you're doing contracts. So, what exactly do we mean? Well, what is a single family detached home? What exactly is a single family detached home, Mr. Grossman? It's a house that's not attached to anything else. It's standalone. It's standalone. Meaning in that particular situation, what does that mean? It does not have, it's not part of another home. So you will see on certain times, they'll say the word single family, and it'll either say attached or detached. And what did we just say? Detached, as Stefan said, is what? It's completely separate. Okay. What is attached, Mr. Eugene? Huh? Is it like a duplex or something? Well, not so much a duplex. It's kind of more the situation. Think of it from this situation. Have you seen those houses? They're not so much of a townhouse, but they're literally full homes. Like they're a normal house, but they're just butted up and built across. Okay. In that situation, that is a single family attached home. Okay. Now, what is a condominium? What's a condominium? Well, yeah, it's a condo, but what is it? It's a condominium is this. You own everything, say this room we're in right here. If this was a condominium, everything within these four walls is what? What is it? You own it, okay? Which means, do you have to pay to get the carpet repaired? No. Yep. Do you have to paint the walls? Yes. Yep. Do you have to replace the light bulbs? Yes. Yeah. So you are responsible for all of those. Now, Mr. Nobles, do you have to paint the exterior walls of your condominium? No. It's part of the complex. Do you have to in the situation, uh, do you end up? Take so in the situation is, is, do you have to go in and do you have to replace the windows? No. Oh, no, that's part, of the, that's part of the complex. What about the electrical wiring? That's still part of it, it goes all over. Well, it depends. Yeah, it's just your, it depends if it's just in your unit, yeah, okay? You have something like this or or plumbing. plumbing, that's right. So in those situations as condominiums, you own the stuff within the four walls, right. okay? Now, on a single family, Mr. Eugene, you have a single family. Do you have to paint your house? Yeah. Why does the Travis have to paint it? It's not his. It's all mine. What about Aiden? Why can't he paint it? I can paint it, too. I'll still make you got to pay it because you own the entire structure. Okay. What about cooperative? What's cooperative? You know what a cooperative is? Here we go. It is this. Mr. Aiden, you purchase a cooperative. What that means is this situation, okay? You end up in this particular situation, you go in and you own part of shares of the business. Do you see what I'm saying? So you could live in this room, but you don't own any of this. Does that make sense? You own interest in the business that owns the building. Does that make sense? Okay. So a cooperative, you own interest in the building. Okay. Now, what about a townhouse? What's a townhouse? A townhouse is where there's a uh, two places. 
townhouse is going to be what? Where the homes are like little homes. They're joined connected together. They're connected. They're butted up and they're connected all the way through. Okay. And oftentimes they're two stories. Okay. So they're two stories and they're butted all the way together. What about a patio or a cluster home? Very similar to a townhouse. Okay. Similar to it. And then you have, of course, your planned unit development. All of these are different types of homes, and you have to know each and every one of these different types of homes. Now, of course, we also have different usage. You do have converted use property. And what that is, I actually saw one today. It's a, it's like, for example, uh, I've got my millionaire smart boy Aiden here in the class, as everybody calls him. And uh, Mr. Aiden buys a hotel, an old hotel, and turns it into a house. Okay, you can convert it into different things. So in that situation, you can have converted use property to be changed. Okay, retirement community. That's probably where you'll find my mom and dad. Um, <laughs> Travis told me that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But retirement community in that situation is uh, you can have an, an area that can be a, a townhouse. It can be a bunch of townhouses, but that entire area is going to be a retirement unit, if you see what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, they can also have mixed use development, meaning that it can have multiple purposes or multiple usage, if that makes sense. Okay. Of course, we know what a manufactured home is. Everybody's aware of that. There's also a modular home, and of course, the favorite, timeshares. I remember when I was younger, my dad, we all went on a trip somewhere, and uh, he had to go in and listen to the timeshare spiel in order to, you know, get to stay there and get benefits and all of that stuff. So you you know too, Travis. Miss Leela, I'm just curious, did you ever get sucked into those timeshares over the years, or ever had to listen to one? Uh, yes, when I went to Vegas, but he was nice and we only had to stay there for 45 minutes. Oh, well, let's see, that's good. That's good. So yeah. some of them can be very high pressured. If you've never been in one, they can be very high pressured. So you got to be very careful with some of these because they use very good sales tactics. Okay. So you just got to be careful in those situations. Now, what makes communities, what makes a home so desirable? What makes what makes Houston more desirable than College Station? Enrique, what makes Houston more desirable than College Station? You've been in both cities. What makes it more desirable? More what? What makes it more desirable? Why is Houston everything? Everything. We have more than one mall. We have more than one mall. <laughs> you can almost just say you have a mall. <laughs> the key thing comes into you have more stuff to do. You have more things to do. Okay. You can actually, Houston, you don't shut down the entire city about nine o'clock. Okay. Things are, that you do more things. Huh? I'm saying Houston here is shut down at nine. Well, I'm saying being from the world. Area. Yeah. Stuff here's over the long Very true. Everything goes into there. Ten, let's see. And that and it depends also location. You know, you go into downtown, they probably are open way. So in that situation, there's always different things. So what makes things desirable? Well, number one, employment opportunities. People want jobs, don't you? You have to tell them to make money. Right? I mean, Steph, do you work for free? No, we don't want to work for free. Okay. Dad, you work for free. I know that much, right? Right? Okay. You get okay. paid? Yeah, we get paid. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know that? So, yeah, you do have employment opportunities. People want to end up going to locations that have employment. Cultural advantages. People like to be around people that are like them. Okay. In that situation, they don't people must stay where they are. If you're a city person, you probably don't want to move to Iola, Texas, or Shiro, Texas. Okay. And vice versa. If you're a country person, you probably don't want to end up 
move into downtown Austin or Houston if you're a country person, okay? There are just the cultural aspects, okay? Your country, you're from different countries. You want to try to fit in. Governmental structure. If you are a, say, a Democrat, you probably don't want to end up moving to a state that is full conservative. And vice versa, if you're a Republican, you probably don't want to move to a location that is what? That's going to be liberal. So it depends on the governmental structure and how the political affiliations are. It comes back to that whole situation of you want to fit in. Okay? You want to fit in with your particular advantage of your culture and of your beliefs and your religions. Social services. Sometimes that's a big thing. Sometimes you may need certain services. You may need mental health services. You may need hospitals. You may need these items. These are things that are necessary. It's probably not a wise idea if Aiden, who's 90 years old and bad health, is living in Cairo, Texas by himself, and the nearest hospital is a long way away. Probably not a wise idea. Okay. Because you, Mr. Aiden, want to have to wait for an hour and a half for an ambulance to get there. Not taking the No. Okay. So you have to make certain, by all means, that you understand the desirability and you understand the location. And lastly, transportation. If you're a college kid, do you want to have to drive on Texas A&M and find a spot to park if you got glass? No. Okay. You want to be able to park somewhere get on a transit bus and be taken to where you need. Unlike in some locations, you get to park on the north side of campus and walk to the south side of campus, okay? It's not something that you wanna do, so transportation is very key. These are things that give that desirability, and it comes back to those three words, location, 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 okay? Location is always key. Now, what about housing affordability? Well, of course, the most important thing is, is the terms of the mortgage. If interest rates are through the roof, what happens? Bills are through the roof. Okay. So in that situation, do you want to buy in an area? For example, Mr. Eugene, do you want to go and move to, um, say, Miami? We're going to move you to Miami Beach. Would you like to move there, sir? Cheap. Oh no, not cheap. No, no, no you're you're moving. You're paying. You're paying I'm not, high. I'm bored now. There you go. The same thing is. It's just like if you move into Houston, you're probably going to pay more than you're going to pay living in Cairo, Texas. Okay, because of the fact is you get amenities. Okay, so of course the mortgage term with the interest rate, with the going payments, how are these going to do? All of this comes into play. The ownership expenses and ability to pay, these are very key as well. The investment considerations, okay? The investment considerations and the opportunities. Can I purchase a house and make money off of it? Any tax benefits, we'll talk about that here in a minute, as well as homeowners insurance. All of these take into play the affordability of houses, okay? Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Aiden, I want to ask you this question, sir. Can housing be very expensive in one city while also being very cheap in the same city? Yes. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Because of what? Location. Exactly. If you are living and you have a house on Lake Conroe and you end up that house and you have a house that mm -hmm. is in the lower income district of Conroe, are those going to be the same price point? No. Why? Because of the fact of the matter is, is you got one that's in a prime location that's more desirable, and the other one in an area that is less desirable. Okay. Same thing here in Bryan College Station. You can end up, if you're living in Indian Lakes or Miramont, things are going to be a lot more expensive there than if you're living in downtown Bryant, okay? So in those situations, you have to understand that these are gonna be items that we take into play, into consideration. Now, what about tax benefits? Well, Mr. Eugene, question for you. Is there benefits that uh, all of this 
buying a home and crap? Is there anything good about it? Why is there, what, what's so good about it, Mr. Eugene? Uh, what? Uh, <clears throat> your homestead. Yeah, homestead. You get exemptions. Also, can you uh, can you get exemptions for capital gains? Yes. If you make a profit. Yeah. I had a client ask me the other day, they said, well, Mr. You, Mr. Justin, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? They said, well, how much taxes am I going to have to pay on this money that I'm, I'm getting right now? I'm making $100,000. I mean, how much do I got to pay on this? We're married. And I said, you don't pay a dime. Not one dime. It is all yours because it is less than $500,000. So in that situation, then you get to keep every penny. Yes, you may have to report it to the IRS, but you don't have to pay. Okay, you're not paying taxes on it. So uh, there are some other deductions. Interest on your first and second homes is deductible. The real estate taxes, okay? Real estate taxes can also be deducted. Any origination fee, you know, of course, Mr. Grossman here, you know, he's going to end up charging you money and everything. You know how Mr. Grossman is for draft alone. So, in that situation, you know, he's getting a little greedy over here, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to end up, it is deductible, any origination fee. Some even loan points or the discount points are also going to end up being deductible. And your private mortgage insurance premiums are deductible. So look at all of that. You're spending a lot, but you're also able to save yourself a lot. Okay. Now this comes into that situation. And this is something if you're not listening, I highly recommend you keep up on real quick. This is that point that I'd like you to listen to is in regards to capital gain. People always ask, me, why do I want to buy a house? Okay, why do I want to end up purchasing a house? Well, if you want to market, here's a prime opportunity right here. Okay, you're a salesman, salesman or saleswoman. Okay, and in that situation, what ends up happening is, is you have to teach people. People don't just buy from you just because you have a real estate license. People buy from you because you are an advocate and you're an educator. It is your duty. You're the expert. It is your duty to do what? To train those individuals and to educate them. Okay. So, Mr. Aiden, when a client comes up to you and says, Well, I've got $1,400 from the government for my stimulus check, and I got $4,000 from, uh, from my tax return, I can't buy a house with that. What's Mr. Aiden going to do if he didn't know anything? Know any better? Yeah, you can. Sorry, you need at least 20% down. And he lets the client leave. That's marketing? No. What should you say, Mr. Aiden? There's many options for loans. You can get with zero, for zero dollars down. That's right. There's many opportunities. There's many op uh, available loans that are out there that can assist you that you could probably move into a new home for only three and a half percent. So every hundred thousand, all you've got to put down is 3,500 bucks. So if you got that $5,000 tax refund, you have enough money to buy you a hundred thousand dollar house. And by the way, guess what? You get all of these deductions next year. So in that situation is, is if you happen to end up, you make a lot of money, it's probably a good idea, what, Mr. Aiden, that you might want to buy a house or an investment so that you can take these deductions and bring down your money. Now, Mr. Eugene, you're a tax guru here. Question for you. I want to ask you this. Deductions, good or bad? It's great. Why, why, what's so special about this thing? Deductions, I get money back. You still have to pay in. You mean Stefan could get money back? Yes. If he got Deductions, we can get some Exactly. So deductions help you. So what it is, when you see deduction, just think of the word deduct. What's that mean? You subtract, take away. So all of this money, Mr. A, you tell your client, all this money that you're paying for that property, not only are you building an asset, but what else are you doing? You're keeping ending up. Yourself. You're keeping that money because you can take deductions off of it. Okay. So very key in that particular situation. 
Now, one other good thing about this is, Mr. Aiden, so I, I, I'm playing here, I'm playing the client. Well, I can't buy a house, Mr. Aiden, because I only have $5,000. What are you going to tell me? Would I just uh, play out? Well, I mean, there's multiple opportunities for loans that you don't get to put 3.5% down. You're telling me I can buy a property for $5,000? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but if I sell it, I'm going to have to spend a lot of money. I'm, I'm probably going to lose money, to be honest with you. I got to pay taxes on that money and all this stuff. So I probably might as well not do it. Let me give you this tax benefit stuff. Okay. Well, what happens if it's I natural. what happens if I sell this property? What if I sell this property, Mr. Aiden? All right, and I happen to make you know God like lyrically give me. I sell it bought it for hundred and I sell it for three hundred fifty. I'm probably going to pay a lot of taxes on it. No. Well, how much tax am I to pay? Not two hundred fifty dollars. Zero dollars. <laughs> Zero dollars. Because why? If I paid a hundred thousand dollars for a house or for some land, I put a hundred grand down. It says right up here that if I'm a single taxpayer, up to two hundred fifty thousand is tax free. Did you hear me again? That's off of, so if I put in a hundred thousand and I sell it for 350, the hundred thousand comes off because that was already my cost. Yeah. I profit at 250. So guess what? How much do I end up paying in taxes? Zero so long as this applies. So long as on the sale of the principal, that's the key thing, principal residence, I've occupied it at least two of the past five years. Okay. So in that situation is I do have the opportunity to end up making money. Okay. So there are opportunities. Do you think your clients know this information? No. Zippo. But if you educate your clients well enough, you can get them to buy a property. You can get them to buy a house. Okay. Another benefit, Mr. Eugene and Ms. Linda and Ms. Leela and Mr. Jacob, everybody that, that's been buying or has a house with the ability, you can get, if you have an IRA and you are a first time home buyer, so if you know somebody that's a first time home buyer, they can take out a $10,000 loan or up to ten thousand dollars, not a loan, but basically it's interest-free withdrawal of up to ten thousand dollars, so long as it goes to a down payment to closing costs. They will not charge you a penalty. Now you could be taxed on it, but it's penalty free. Okay, depends on how you apply it. Of course, you want to talk to an individual that is a um, an educated CPA, road agent, or another tax professional. But again, you, would, you do have the opportunity to take money out of your IRA and end up applying it to your down payment or closing costs. Okay. There's also the Texas Mortgage Credit Certificate. If you are a moderate or low income first time home buyer, okay, you can have up to 40% of your annual mortgage interest paid, but it cannot exceed $2,000 a year. So if you happen to be a low income or a moderate first time home buyer, you could get this certificate that they will apply $2,000 per year to your interest for you. Three. Seeing some positives here, the marketing opportunities. Okay. There is also a state tax exemption. Each person in 2016 could give up to $5.45 million per person in 2016. And assets that were over $5.45 million was taxed at 40%. So long as your estate is less than this, you're set. Unfortunately, Mr. Aiden, for you, yours is over $5.45 million, so you would get taxed, okay? okay. Yes, you do. That's why they always tell you, if you have a lot of money, the government wants their fair share. Okay, they always do. 
Now, of course, it does combine the five types of coverage. Okay, it does combine them in regards to homeowners insurance, right? And I'm always going to throw this in real quick. By the way, I do sell insurance, so if any of your clients need it, let me know. <laughs> I've always got to throw that in there. But yes, there is uh, coverage. And that's actually one of the things I like as being an insurance agent. You got to be careful with it, though, just so that there's no conflict of interest. Uh, but again, there is opportunities that you can help your clients save even more money. Okay, and that's part of being in sales. You want to be licensed in as much as you can. But again, there are five types of coverage. Now, of course, Mr. Aiden, I'm going to ask you this question. Actually, I'm not going to pick up Mr. Aiden. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to look here at Mr. Keith. Mr. Keith, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Keith, what is the word dwelling? Dwelling? Yes, sir. Um, I would say dwelling is uh, harping on something. Uh, you're kind of uh, stuck, uh, on, stuck on something. I want to say to you here, it's your house. Okay. That's what it is. So when you see the word dwelling, it means the house or the structures in which you live. So gotcha. right here on the first one, there's five types of coverages. The first coverage is your dwelling. And the dwelling is where you currently reside. Okay. Gotcha. Now, Miss Linda, what's personal property? Personal properties are things that you can uh, that are that is not attached. Well, we know that, but we're talking insurance. So, oh, personal properties is covered in what? So, you basically say things that are here are inside the what? Really? Inside the home. Right. So, the first one is we cover the structure itself. The second one, we cover the Items within the home. What's liability? What's liability, Mr. Garrett? What's liability? Did you call on me? Yes, sir. Uh, if there's like an accident. Liability is going to be something if there is an accident, such like a person. So if somebody comes on your property and they trip and fall or get injured or a tree falls on them while they're on your property, these are all going to be things that would be covered as a liability. What, uh, Mr. Aiden, is medical? Uh, well, if a tree falls on Stefan, what happens? He's got to go where? He's got to go to the hospital. So in that situation, they need to be payments for it, right? Take a tree. Yeah. You can take a tree. What about loss of use? That well, can you? Well, not just that, but could you possibly be loss of use of a property or of an item or something? Could be yourself, but it could be a, a equipment. Loss of use of your car. Okay, there are different things in these situations, but these are your different types of coverages. Now, wait, since you said liability, and then you said if like a tree falls on them, uh -huh. would the li liability cover if they tried to sue. Liability can also be used in that. That's why you'll see here in a minute, a lot of this stuff overlaps. Okay. Okay, you're going to see a lot of this overlaps because just like dwelling, you would think dwelling would also include what? Everything inside of the building as well, right? But again, it depends on your policy and how it's written. That's why we have insurance lawyers. Because okay. the fact is, is that it all comes down to a play of words is what it comes down to. Now, do you need to know all of these in detail? No, you simply need to know the basics. You're not getting, you're sitting for your insurance license. So the very basic, but yes, for what he's talking about in regards to liability, yes, that would cover if a tree falls on somebody, there's liability, but you would have to hire an attorney, that liability would also apply to that as well. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Now, there are three standard policies standard policies. There is your HOA. Now we're not talking about homeowners association. If that's why it's HO-A. And that's what we call the actual cash value coverage. Okay. So whatever value it is, whatever the actual cash value coverage is, that's what we're going to actually cover for the damage. So if there was $5,000 worth of damage, we'll, we'll cover you for $5,000 worth of damage. Okay. There is the HOB, 
and that is the repay, uh, replacement cost coverage for the real estate. So had a tree fell on uh, Ms. Leela's house and it caused $15,000 of damage, they would give her $15,000, okay? They're not gonna give her a penny more to replace it, okay? So it may have cost, or it may have actually been say 15,000, but in reality, to get it redone, it's gonna cost 30. Well, she only has HOA, so she's only gonna get the actual value, the cash value. She's not gonna get a replacement cost. With HOV, you get the replacement cost coverage for your real estate, as well as the actual cash value coverage for the personal property. So A is dealing with the property itself. B gives you the replacement cost as well as coverage for your personal property. And C is the most extensive coverage, it covers everything. So depending upon what insurance policy you're with, depending on where you're at, you could be an HOA, a HOB, or HOC. Now, if you have a mortgage on your property, what does your loan officer want you to have? HOC. HOC. Because they want to be covered for everything. But Ms. Linda, right. can you possibly, if you paid off your home, could you just have a joy? Yes. Yes, you could. Okay. So you got to look at these different policies and you have to, now I'm going to say this, you do not ever as a real estate agent educate your client on insurance unless you're licensed. If you're not licensed, you don't need to be saying anything. Makes sense. You can tell them other differences, but you always advise them to see a licensed insurance agent. It's just like you as a real estate agent. You don't want license or insurance agent quoting or telling them how real estate works, okay? Vice versa, you let that person deal with it. There are also approved alternative policies as well. You can buy different types of policies as well and different types, okay? Now, Ms. Linda, what's an endorsement? Uh, I know what it is. It is something that's added. Yes. You know how we use uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Travis, do, uh, do we add things to contracts ever in real estate? Yeah, do we ever add things to a contract? Yeah, what's it called? An addendum. In their term, in insurance language, it's called an endorsement. Okay, so when you, Mr. Grossman, when you were dealing with your transaction the other day, uh, and you, your client wants to sell their property before they buy this one, what did you, what did you do? What did you put, to, what did you do to your contract? What did you include? Well, uh, to, uh, the sale of property. Buyer. That's correct. What? Why were you adding that into the contract? So, so we had so the other people know we need to sell our own property. That's correct. You need it to add it so that there's that coverage there. So if they can't sell their property, what could they do? Walk away. Okay. So the same thing comes into an endorsement. Okay. Now, does these policies? Let's go back here. Do you think that these policies, Mr. Eugene, on insurance, do all of these, these cover flood, right? Flood insurance? Why, why are you shaking your head no, sir? Why doesn't homeowner's insurance, you, you telling me that your homeowner's insurance that you have doesn't just automatically include flood insurance? Oh, no. Why? That's something else. Wait, 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 wait. Why? But why? I don't ask them, they won't do it. <laughs> That's right. They won't include it because of why. Why won't they end up including it? Because it's a different policy. Because in that particular situation, it's a different policy. Okay? So you have to make certain by all means that we end up, that you have to understand that while, yes, these policies do cover, like we said back here, the dwelling and all, the thing is, is that what? You do have in some situations, you have to understand that it's not automatically going to go through because here's the problem. If you lived in Houston 
probably remember what? Hurricane Harvey. What, what did Hurricane Harvey do, Mr. Travis? Not much? Yeah. Nothing at all, right? Put five feet of water in your great-grandfather's house. Put five feet of water in your great-grandfather's house. Yeah, the house is yeah, the whole house is a pool, right? So, but the thing is, is that you have to understand that what happens, Mr. Eugene, if you've dealt with this before, if you have five feet of water in your house, you just drain it out and keep living in it, right? You don't have to do any repairs or anything, right? Nothing at all, right? Yeah, you swim through it. Yeah, you swim through it, right? Yeah. Black mold don't kill you. We've had a, we've had a landlord tell us that, right? Mr. Grossman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those wasp honeys, you know, that's that's what that's what it is. So in that situation, like I tell people all the time, is, is that flood insurance, it can destroy an entire house. It can destroy it. It can make you gut the whole thing down to the bare bones and have to start all over. Okay. Yeah, it, it literally will destroy it all. Okay. So in that situation is, is if you want to do flood insurance, you have to pay separate. It's not going to be included. Now, what we deal with in flood insurance and in dealing with flood in this area, there's what up north they deal with windstorms. Okay. A a storm, a windstorm can be so strong it can literally blow houses down if they're not built properly. Actually, somebody sent me a uh, video the other day of a person that was building. They were just framing the house, and a wind, uh, windstorm came through and knocked the entire thing down because it wasn't properly done. Okay, so in that situation, understand that wind windstorms they also have separate policies. So it's just like with anything else, you have to sometimes buy additional endorsements to your policy. And each endorsement costs what? Costs money. Okay. And the more chances. So, do you think, Mr. Uh, Eugene, that flood insurance here in College Station is going to be the same amount as, say, Mr. Enrique down in Houston? Oh, why not? He has a higher chance. What, if, what about Mr. Mr. Uh, Travis's uh, mother that lives in Galveston? It's a lot cheaper, right? Yeah. Why is it going to be hot? She's right there at the coach. She's right there at the water. She's right there. She's in the hot part of Dallas. So there you go. <laughs> so, in that situation, then, now let's ask Mr. Aiden in Amarillo. What about flood insurance uh, over there? It's, it, it's really expensive over there, right? Because, you know, it's it way up there, right? I don't think it's, it's even offered in Amarillo, honestly. Why, why do you think it's not offered? Because it rains like three days a year there. It <laughs> rains like three days a year there. So there's no need of it, right? So in that situation, you've got to look at all of these different situations and how it's applied. Okay. Again, you can have co-insurance clause in place. Of course, these are insured 80% of the replacement cost. Sometimes you may end up, you may be in an area. For example, you may have a house on Lake Condor. The insurance company may only say, I will insure up to 80%. You want the other 20% covered, you've got to have co-insurance. You gotta bring somebody else in because they don't want to be obligated for the whole amount. They want somebody else on the book. So again, insurance of eighty percent of the replacement cost is reimbursed full uh, payment minus any deductible. Okay. If they are insured less than eighty percent of the replacement cost, then they reimburse actual cash value, the cost of the repairs minus depreciation, or they prorate it on a percentage of that eighty percent coverage. So here's the problem. How many people fully actually understand their insurance? This is what happens most of the time, okay? You walk in and you just say, hey, the government told me, Mr. A, that I need insurance. I, and you're like, okay, well, how much do you want? I don't know, just whatever they tell me. Okay, we'll put you in the state minimum. Well, is that gonna cover you? No. no. I was talking to somebody today when I was quoting uh, auto insurance for them. They were like, well, what, what, how much do I need? I probably need the maximum. And I said, well, you want $500,000 of coverage for auto insurance for your car? Well, yeah, that's what, what I was told before. I said, no, you're just making the agent rich. 
I said, is your car worth five hundred thousand dollars? No, my car is only worth ten. Well, then you probably just need the basic policy. See, people don't understand this, and that's where agents get to make the money. Okay, because the more they spend, the more what? The more they make. Okay, so again, in these situations, you have to be aware of. It. Now, what about the criteria to establish a policy premium? Okay. Well, these are things that they're going to look into. They're going to look at the age and the condition of the home. Okay. If a home is older, are they going to probably be cheaper or more expensive in insurance? Why is it going to be more expensive, Mr. Eugene? Don't know what's all wrong with it. You don't know what's all wrong with it. Okay. What about the replacement cost? Well, if it's a brand new home probably going to be a lot more expensive than a older home. Okay. Or it could be vice versa. It really depends. What about the materials? If you have, say, a home that's brand new with party plank all around it, and it's very basic, and it's brand new, it's built in 2021, versus a house that was built in 1960, and it has Tuscal um, brick that came in from overseas, which one's going to be more expensive? But it's older. You're not going to be able to replace it because it's going to cost more money. Okay. What about location? That's going to be key. If you have a house that's in a high prime location or a house that's in a location that floods or tornado alley, it's going to be more. Also, what about the fire protection? Just like flooding, can fire destroy a home? Yeah. And sometimes fire is a lot quicker than a flood. Okay. So again, how's the house built? What type of electricity ran through it? How's the wiring in that house? What about the claims history? Why is that important? Hey, what's, the, what's so important about claims history? What's so important about that? It may be a problem. Yeah. If Mr. Eugene's constantly over here filing a claim every year, there's, there's a problem here. Okay. What about Mr. Eugene's credit score, Mr. Grossman? There's no big deal about that. He has a 400. There's no big deal, right? Uh, it's not great. Why is it not great? Yeah. That's great, eh? Uh, I like better than mine. <laughs> Probably better than mine. <laughs> If you have bad credit, what's that mean, Mr. Stahl? If he, if he has a 400, what's that mean probably on him paying his policy? That's right. Okay. So, again, these are things that they decide on your premium. Now, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Aiden, because you're probably one of my younger people. What's the word premium? What's that? Um, it's the... Uh, okay, over well, when? No, 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 no. It's when you file a claim. Oh, now I'm getting. I'm getting here. You sure? I don't know, man. I didn't take. That's get you good, aren't I? Go. Get you good, aren't I? Yeah. Premium is what you pay to get the policy. So well, if you want the policy, you are right in the beginning. It's what you pay monthly, or you can pay it all at once. Yeah. And it's a few. You pay all at once. It's what I was I was talking to somebody the other day about. You pay all at once. They normally give you a discount. Like I did my auto insurance. I switched myself over to my own policy. And I saved myself a ton of money, talking to over a thousand bucks. Okay, well, I year. paid it all up front for the year. For the year so I saved myself a thousand dollars, okay, for that year. But you can't pay it out. But if you pay it out, what do they do? They, they add fees and get all that on top of it, which makes it more expensive, okay? So again, your premium is what you pay for the policy, just half. The deductible is what you're talking about. When the accident occurs, that's when the deductible is paid. Now, Mr. Eugene, is all deductibles the same? So you're telling me that Miss Leela's deductible and Mr. Jacob's deductible can be different from yours? Oh, yeah. What? Really? You're kidding. I thought Miss Leela and Mr. Jacob and you only paid $50. That's all you had to pay. Oh, it's twenty-five dollars. Oh man, I did this little bit. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, what happens is, is yeah, if you pay fifty or twenty-five dollars or a hundred dollars, 
What happens to your premium, Mr. Eugene? Does it go down or up? Why is it going to go up? Well, your deductible, the lower it is, the higher the risk that that person is assuming, which means what? They want you to pay more up front. Okay. But if you have a higher deductible, the premium goes down because you're assuming more of the risk. Okay. Now, flood insurance, now, Mr. Eugene, you said this comes for free, right? They just give that to you for free? I wish it did. Why, why doesn't it come for free? Hey, you've got to pay. Now, here's where you need to know this as real estate agents. This is very key in this situation. Flood insurance is for all water that's coming from the outside in, not from the inside out. So if Mr. Or Mr. Jacob is at home one night, and he's sitting there visiting with his family, and he starts seeing the toilet in his bathroom starts overflowing and floods through his entire house, what happens? Is he covered? Yes, he is. Because of the fact of the matter is, the water's coming from where? Inside, Inside the house going out, not coming in from the outside into the house. So his policy would most likely cover him. But in regards to flood insurance, if it is water coming from the exterior in, it would not be covered. You see how this works. So when you flood a house, Mr. Aiden goes and throws a big party with all his buddies, and somebody thinks it's a smart idea to go and, you know, stop up the tub and fill it up with water, and then all of a sudden it overfloods, and, and it goes, to, that's covered under the whole world. Now it's negligent. May be intentional, may not be covered, but it's still going to be under the policy because it's interior. So if, if a flood happens, it will stop up the tub overflowing. As long as you as long as you can try to prove it, good luck. But but again, you have to make certain that that's why I always tell people all the time is you got to be very careful. So again, what they're coming back here is flood insurance. It is required if the structure is in a floodplain. Now you're going to probably curse, and I promise you, you will probably curse uh, in real estate when you're dealing with this. When a structure, when it's talking about a structure, they're not talking about the house being in the floodplain. They're talking about the property being in the floodplain. And I had this happen. This is where I told people you're going to curse because here's what's going to happen. So here I am. I'm, I'm uh, selling Mr. Enrique a house. And if Mr. Enrique, probably knowing your luck and my luck, we're probably on the same one here. But I'm selling Mr. Enrique a house. Well, guess what? He's buying 15 acres, big old house. The house is at the very front of the 15 acres. But in the very back corner, just one foot, one foot, like a human foot, that one foot in the back corner of his property is in a floodplain. Does he need flood insurance? Yes. Yep. Yes, he does. Because that one foot. Changes. Because that one foot is in the floodplain. And if that one foot is in the floodplain, even if it's 15 acres away from the structure, he still has to have flood insurance. No one's saying flood stop. Okay. There's only one. Unfortunately, you can't. He is stuck. And I had an issue where we tried to get rid of it and give the neighbor that one foot. We could not. We could not. How far, like for instance, if you, you know, sometimes you'd be driving and you see the mistake and it says three, four, five, and you can tell it's automatically, a, you know, that's stating a flood zone. How far do you can, do you have to live away from that state? That's not you how it works. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Okay. On, the, on the MLS, there's a you can flood map. map. Yeah, and it'll tell you exactly where the way the flood map is. Yes, yes. I, I was looking at a house that was literally 
there was her front yard, basically the line between her yard and her neighbor's yard that she was looking at. There was that stake that had the one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Looked on looked on the flood map, not a flood. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, like none of it was in a flood zone. That so I was like, surprisingly, it's not a flood zone. <laughs> like, you would think it would be because yeah. of that sign, but it wasn't. So that's what I thought. Yeah, exactly. So in that particular situation, like I tell people, is in this situation, is you have to end up if the property is in a flood plain. You have to, in that particular situation, you got to make certain by all means, okay, that that property is, like I said, they look at the 500, they go 500 and a 100 here, flood map, okay? So in that particular situation, the flood map is actually going to tell you. Now, I've had a client before, he was like, I've lived here, my grandmother, or let's see, it's him, his parents, his grandparents have lived in this property. It has never flooded, ever, ever. But it was in a flood pipe. And he's like, it's never flooded. It doesn't matter. You have to hire FEMA to go out and do a or a, a topographic uh, study, which costs tens of thousands of dollars to say that you're not going to flood for you to be able to go out here. And most clients are going to pay tens of thousands of dollars just to get it out of that rock. Okay, for that. Yes, Mr. Trade. Okay, so if you, in that one foot situation, if you were to buy the property, could you sell, you know, three hundredths of an acre to Noble's Realty Group, and then buy flood insurance on that three tenths of an acre in the back? Well, and the best way to do it is to just do the back to the city. Okay. So say Nick here, say he ends up he has fifteen acres, mm -hmm. and one acre in the back of his property is flood zone. Flood zone. He may just want to say, you know what, I don't deal with flood insurance. I don't want to pay the $250 or $500 a month. Here's the city of Houston, pay for it. Yeah, I, I gave that crap away. That's taxes all. I can do it, get rid of that. I don't want to deal with it. Huh? City. They don't have to take it, but if he's gifting it, he, he's, they're going to take it. Guess what? Mr. Mr. Nick here got him a nice little tax right. You see how this works. But the key coming back to your question is, you already have to own it. So if Mr. Andy comes in and he's buying its property, Mr. Andy can't say, Nick, go sell that so I don't have to pay. He has to buy it as is and then do it after the fact. But let me tell you something. If Andy has a loan on it, do you think, do you think that the lender's just gonna let you Andy go and give her the property? Hey, no, no. Because they, they are paying for all of that land. So they ain't going to allow you just to get rid of it, okay? So again, in this situation, you have to make certain that you understand that just because they say the word structure, it does not mean structure. It means the property as a whole. Makes sense. And it also is on properties with federally regulated loans. So in this situation, if you're using an FHA, VA, USDA, you got to have it. No, they're saying buts. Okay. Now, this is that part I was just telling you. The lender may require if any of the properties in the floodplain, if any of it's in the floodplain, guess what? It ends up, it's going to be included. And all property types, no matter if it's residential, commercial, industrial, or agricultural, it's all included. Every bit of it. Okay. Now, these covered losses. Again, we're going to cover any overflow of inland or tidal waters, an unusual or rapid accumulation or runoff from the surface water. Okay, mudslides, mud flows of the surface of normally dry land, or collapse of land along the shore of a body of water. I'm going to cover you for these situations. Huh. All right, so that's that ends for this chapter. So uh, we're not going to. Don't, don't log out. Go ahead and stop the recording.